and Linnea is planning to do, do an otology fellowship at the Silverstein Institute. So she's going to be talking about temporal bone anatomy. Great. And I will share my screen. Yeah. Uh, ha -ha. Whoop. And we are doing dish button. Is it working? It's good. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, like Dr. Carr mentioned, my name is Linnea, um, Chief Resident. Very, very fun state of life right now. Um, yes, yeah, so I went to Case Western for medical school and they had an option to get uh, a concurrent master's degree in applied anatomy, which I did because it sounded super fun. Um, and it was fun. It was exactly everything that I dreamed it would be. Um, so I really enjoy anatomy. Uh, I was told that someone wanted a temporal bone talk. So you guys are about to get one. It's going to be great. I have no financial disclosures. It's just sort of a joke. I actually don't. But one of my chiefs used to always kind of talk about, unfortunately, I have no financial disclosures. And I was like, heh, heh, someday. So my objective for today is to give a brief overview of the temporal bone and its context in the skull, and then the important structures that are nearer and dearer to my heart, the ear stuff and the facial nerve, and then some surgical anatomy and relationships. Um, I know when people ask for an anatomy talk, you don't want just like anatomy, you want why it's relevant to you and why it's relevant to ENT. So we'll kind of hit that up throughout and a little bit at the end. Um, and just again, with surgical anatomy and relationships, it's always important to know um, where you are and what's nearby. Um, like one of my anatomy professors used to say, if you're ever feeling lost, either in a dissection or in surgery, find your friend, and then that'll help you know where you are. Um, some of the sources I use for this talk and some of the good pictures, I just thought I'd kind of list up front. Um, Anatomy is tricky to learn, the temporal bone anatomy in particular, it's all 3D thinking and you can never overestimate how important it is to have some good resources. So on Head Mirror, they have that nice 3D temporal, um, temporal bone atlas. I think you have to have 3D goggles to like really get a sense of the 3D anatomy of it. I don't have those, but I still thought the pictures are pretty good. Um, Dr. Jackler also has both of his atlases available online through Stanford. Um, he's got an ear surgery one and also one just for skull base. So some of my um, the illustrations I have in this talk are from there. Cummings always has some good stuff going on. And some of the endoscopic pictures also later are from the Journal of Visualized Experiments, um, which are just beautiful, beautiful pictures. So here is the good old standard netter temporal bone picture, nice pink temporal bone, it's present bilaterally, and this is just to get a sense of the context of where it is. It articulates with that cranial skeleton, the parietal sphenoid maxillary and occipital bones. Um, the floor, it forms the floor and the wall of the middle and posterior cranial fossa. It's got some, actually, I don't know how much of this is q and I'll just, I'll just say things at you. I don't know if it's worth it to have you unmute. But there's like the massive foramen for the transverse sinus to pass through the dura mater. The Temporal bone forms the posterior lateral border of the frame and lastrum, which is where the great petrosal nerve comes through. It forms the anterior part of the carotid canal where the ICA is coming up. It forms Meckel's cave where the trigeminal ganglion is sitting. It's got the IAC in it with cranial nerves 7, 8, and the labyrinthine arteries. It's got the jugular frame in with the IJ cranial nerves 9, 10, or 11, and the posterior meningeal artery. All this important stuff going on in there, stylomastoid foramen, or the facial nerve comes out. Normally I'd be pimping you on all these things, but I'm just gonna tell you the answer is it's fine. Unless someone wants to turn on their, their mute and tell me what three muscles attach to the styloid process. Probably not, no takers. Okay, there's three and they all start with stylo. Stylo pharyngeus, stylo glossus, and stylo hyoid. Fun stuff. Um, the temporal bone also provides attachment for some important muscles, temporalis. Obviously, um, muscle mastication. The SCN, some neck muscles like splenius capitis, lunges and capitis, and the posterior belly, the gastric, all that fun stuff. Forms the glenoid fossa where the TMJ articulates. It contributes a lot like, with the zygomatic root and the zygomatic arch, it articulates to the rest of the facial skeleton, forming part of those important buttresses. You got your vertical buttresses of the face and your horizontal buttresses of the face, which all contribute to the functional and cosmetic parts of the face. Didn't know the face had a had a function, did it? It does. Very important. Um, and then, of course, like the ear canal, the temporal bone connects through the to the um, 
Toward the parotid gland, there's like the foramen of Hotchkey. If you heard of that, there's some like bony canal defect there that's supposed to close as you get older. But if it doesn't, it can be an avenue for uh, ear infections to spread down to the parotid or kind of vice versa. All these very important things going on because all these very important things are in a tight space. So here's another nice view into the temporal bone. There are four parts of the temporal bone. Again, tempting opportunity. I could ask you what they are. But you got the squamous, kind of the nice flat part, the mastoid, the tympanic part, and the petrous part of the temporal bone. Some books argue that there's a fifth part, which is the styloid, but I have like never heard a neurotologist say that. So I'm just going to stick to my guns and say there are four parts of the temporal bone. If anyone ever asks you, what are the four parts of the temporal bone? Squamous, mastoid, tympanic, and petrous. Do not forget. Very important. So if we take this view, kind of this, this right side of the temporal bone, and we think about what's a little bit deeper, the stuff that I really care about, which is the ear stuff. So you have your ear canal leading into your TM. You can see, um, actually, can you see my mouth on this? Can you see my mouth? You can, perfect. Um, you can see uh, the schematic of the facial nerve being here, the um, semicircular canals back here, the mastoid air cells, the sigmoid sign that's running through, making the jugular bulb and then down the jugular vein, the carotid's right there, glenoid fossa again is right there. Kind of being able to see how close all these things are gives you an insight into why some of these pathologies happen or why certain pain things get referred to the ear. So one thing, if you have a patient coming in with ear pain, one of my attendings would always say there are three things that cause ear pain. There's the ear itself, the jaw, or the neck. And that all comes into how close these structures are and how this innervation works. So the glenoid fossa is right there. That's why TMJ pain can get referred to the ear. Um, and then Jacobson's nerve, which if you remember the um, Glossopharyngeal comes out of the jugular foramen, and the Jacobson's nerve comes up and comes back in to the temporal bone through the inferior tympanic canaliculus and synapses along the promontory, providing like carrying some of the parasympathetic stuff, but it also brings a little bit of that sensation back. So that's why you can get neck stuff referred up into the ear as well. Um, and I guess just for completeness, there's also that little branch of 10 that comes off and comes back and innervates the ear canal, the Arnold's nerve. That's why you can get a cough reflex when you're cleaning out someone's ear and they cough. That's through that little branch of vagus. So kind of all this really wonderful anatomy is all up in here. Now I'm going to talk about ear stuff, though, because that's what I love. So here's a nice coronal view of the temporal bone and all those important stuff that's in there. One of the things to stress, and we have actually this picture up in our clinic, um, to tell patients that the roof of the ear is the floor of the brain. So you have someone coming in with, like, CS coderia or some kind of CSF leak, and I'm like, well, how did this happen? Well, it's right there, sitting right up above all this stuff. Um, you can have dehiscence of that area, either post-surgical, post-traumatic, idiopathic, and that's why you can get CSF leaks out of there. And we had a couple of patients come into clinic where they had had a middle ear effusion, someone put an ear tube in, and they just keep le leaking clear fluid. If that happens, you have to be suspicious for a CSF odorrhea. Never forget. Tips and tricks, pearls, don't forget that one because people do. Um, and also the brain being right there is how these middle ear infections get spread up into the brain. So we had another patient just a couple weeks ago um, that came in with ear infection, altered mental status, had a big old temporal lobe abscess. So all these things are very close to each other and can spread around. Um, not only is the brain right there, but you got the eustachian tube. So it's intimately associated with the nasal pharynx as well. Um, which is why you can get middle ear effusions with nasopharyngeal masses. One of the things you have to be um, aware of if you have an adult coming in with an otherwise kind of like unexplained unilateral middle ear effusion, you always want to evaluate their nasal pharynx because it could be blocking the eustachian tube and leading to fluid in the middle ear. So all these anatomical relationships are important. Um, the other things, I'm going to talk about how the anatomy plays into the mechanism of hearing. So you've got your eardrum connecting to your ossicles, malleus, and stapes, looking up to the cochlea, um, all the important nerves running through there, the facial nerve, I'll hit again really hard, but you've also got the cord of tympani, the tympanic plexus we talked about, um, Arnold's nerve, and again, big blue, and then the carotid kind of right down there, hanging out along the inferior surface. And then, of course, the deeper stuff, the labyrinth, the semicircular canals, the cochlea, all that stuff. I want one more, one more, other clinical pearl I really want to hit home about the mastoid air cells. So this one, if you have your middle ear space and then you're opening into the mastoid, in a well-aerated 
for some nice healthy ear, there's a lot of air cells in here. You'll have patients come in with an ear infection or otitis media, and there'll be a little bit of fluid in the mastoid, and that radiologist is going to say there's mastoiditis in there. Mastoiditis is a clinical diagnosis. You can see now, clearly, for all the world to see, the mastoid air cells are connected to the middle ear space. If there's fluid in the middle ear, there's going to be fluid in the mastoid. It's just how the anatomy works. Not all fluid in the mastoid air cell is mastoiditis. Okay. That's a public service announcement. Remember that. And you guys are all ENT residents someday. You can all rage with me. All right. So let's talk about the eardrum. Now I didn't think you were going to see an eardrum in a temporal bone anatomy talk, did you? Ha. It's all related. So um, I don't remember, well, I don't know how your medical school experience has been, but I feel like I didn't really get a good look at an eardrum until I was a resident. So here's a nice, big, beautiful, healthy looking TM. Um, you guys are all on mute, but how would you, how do you tell a left eardrum from a right eardrum just by looking at it? Appropriate silence for people to think about it. Um, the way Adrian remembers it is probably the way that's easiest to remember it is the side that, oh, someone on mute. No, never mind. I'll just keep talking. It's, like the short process of the malleus where it's pointing. Yes, thank you. That's how I remember it. <laughs> Perfect. I'm justified. <laughs> so yes. So where the short process of the malleus is pointing, it's pointing to my left. So that's the side that the TM is on. The other option, which Adrian reminded me of, is whatever side the cone of light is pointing to. So either of these things can tell you that this is a left TM. So we got our nice um, landmarks that we can see, the umbo, the manubrium, the short process of the malleus. You can almost sort of start to see the incus a little bit in there. Um, whenever you're looking at someone's ear, you want to get a good look at the sputum. Just kind of this bony roof here. Um, look at the pars placida. You can look for any kind of retraction sockets for any erosion. You're kind of always looking out for clesteatoma. Look through the TM as much as you can. Um, and then I guess the other question is, how do you tell whether there's an effusion or not? A lot of people are going to see effusions that aren't there. You can have um, like an opacity behind the tympanic membrane or air fluid levels or like air bubbles. Okay, excellent. Yes, yeah, so you can, sometimes it's pretty obvious. You can see like big bulging. Sometimes you can see the bubbles. Sometimes I will say the bubble thing can get a little confusing because some people have these weird scars on their TM and you think, what that guy, is that an air fluid level? I'm not really sure. One of the most sensitive tests um, to determine if there's an effusion or not is pneumatic otoscopy. So either if you put the speculum in and puff a little bit of air, you can have them do that. Or if you just have the patient Valsalva try to pop their ears, sometimes you can kind of see the fluid moving around in there. Or if it's not fluid and their eardrum moves normally, you can kind of see the pressure move in and out. Um, so definitely start having people do Valsalvas when you look in their ears, you'll discover amazing things. I had a patient, um, I was coming in with unilateral hearing loss, a lot of fullness in her ear, um, like recent weight loss and all this and I was kind of thinking oh it sounds like he's station tube dysfunction she probably has like an infusion in her ear and I took a look at it, and her eardrum looked amazing I was like can you pop your ears and it just like moved perfectly and I was like my whole history like got derailed by this physical exam finding <laughs> I did a tuning fork test and it lateralized to the opposite ear so she had like a sensory neural loss on that side and we're all just like we gotta get an MRI MRI results still pending but that's still History and physical, super important. So we got a nice normal TM, and then just to get a sense of what you're looking at, if you look at something that's a little bit less normal, um, this is a, what a retracted eardrum would look like. The TM is still there, it's just all plastered onto those ossicles. You still have your umbo, your manubrium, your short process. Now you can really see um, the incus and then the incutostopedial joint. You can maybe even appreciate, I don't know if that's supposed to be the tendon, maybe a little bit there, I don't know. but that's what a retracted eardrum would look like. And then if you just take the eardrum off entirely, ta-da, super beautiful endoscopic pictures. Very cool. So you can start to see how close this anatomy all really is. So here's our, again, umbo, manubrium, short process, neck, incus, incutostopedial joint. Here's that stapedial tendon coming off the pyramidal eminence. And then boom, right there, facial nerve. So pyramidal eminence uh, is a good landmark for the second genu of the facial, no facial nerve. Um, we'll get a nice picture of the facial nerve in the end so that all this will kind of start to make a little bit of sense. 
I wanted to put this after the eardrum picture because we're kind of moving from outside to inside. Uh, here's that promontory with Jacobson's nerve, which I keep talking about, um, the hypotympanum, the carotid right there. So just, I guess, the orient, anterior is this way, posterior is this way, superior, inferior. Here's our tensor tympani muscle um, coming up along where the eustachian tube would also be. Um, and then this, you might be able to see, is the cochleariform process, which the tensor tympani muscle attaches to. That's another landmark uh, for where the facial nerve is passing. So the facial nerve passes up superior to that. You can see it moving along. It's superior to the oval window. It gets near the pyramidal eminence, and it takes that second genu and starts going more vertically. Um, so these are all kind of the middle ear structures that you're looking for when you're trying to remind yourself where that facial nerve is. It's one of the most important things to know where that guy is and where the carotid is. Those are ones you definitely want to always know where they're hanging out. Um, so if we move a little bit deeper, and then I'll kind of get back to this picture and talk more about surgical relationships again. Um, we got the labyrinth, um, the nice um, semicircular canals, sacular saccule, and the cochlea all hanging out. Um, the thing that uh, that really kind of hit home for me and explained a lot of things in my head is that the fluid between the semicircular canals and the cochlea is all pretty much connected, which is why if you're doing um, surgery for vestibular schwannoma and the patient doesn't have any hearing and you're going through the labyrinth, well, you'd only go through the labyrinth if you weren't worried about preserving hearing because if you're taking out the labyrinth and sucking in all that fluid, the cochlea may physically be there, but it's not going to work anymore. Um, and then this picture is just kind of a reminder of how all this anatomy plays into how this whole amazing hearing mechanism works. Like hearing is so cool. Just throw that out there. It's really awesome. So you have your air waves that move the eardrum, um, move through the ossicles, kind of advertise that to help overcome this air to fluid shift that needs to happen. Um, the fluid wave will move the basilar membrane or move the organ of cordy. Oh, I was just talking about it. There we are, the basilar membrane um, to get that all transferred into a nervous, a nerve signal that will go to your brain. But if any part of that anatomy isn't working, then you're going to have a hearing loss. If you got perforations, if you got fixation of your ossicles, or um, just articulation of your ossicles, if you've got um, some kind of fistula in, oh, I'm going here, some kind of fistula in the bony labyrinth, like if you have a semicircular canal dehiscence, you're going to lose some of the fluid mechanics that way. That's why people have a hearing loss, the semicircular canal dehiscence. Um, if you've got something wrong with your station too that's making this all fill up with fluid, that's going to stop coming through too. So you kind of got to differentially diagnose with all this anatomy stuff. Super fun. Um, I kept threatening to talk about the facial nerve, so we shall. Does anyone know how many segments of the facial nerve there are? It's getting dark in my house. I let you think about it. Wait, I saw somebody put up put up a thing. I saw a hand. Well, there are five extra temporal branches of the facial nerve, but there are six segments. I appreciate, I can only see, I can only see like one of you on the screen thing, but I appreciate you guys chiming in. Thank you. So here's this beautiful picture of the facial nerve out of Cummings. Um, so the first part of the facial nerve where it comes off the brainstem is just the brainstem to the IAC, and that's the intracranial part. It then enters um, the IAC, which just goes from the fundus of the IAC to the natal foramen, which is where this picture picks up. Um, and the labyrinthine part, which is the shortest part, is only about four millimeters long from the medial foramen to the geniculate ganglion. Um, it is the shortest and most susceptible to inflammation. Um, this is one of the areas they talked about when they used to do like surgical compressions for Bell's palsy. The thought is that this, this segment of the nerve is in a watershed area as far as blood supply goes. So that's why it's like the most likely to be damaged or the most likely to be inflamed and kind of not be able to recover from it. Um, so the thought was that if you're able to decompress this area, Bell's palsy would get better. You don't really do that surgery as much anymore. Darn. No. Um, so it's the first genu there. And then if you remember what we talked about with like the tensor timidity muscle, and there's a structure up here called the cochleariform process, which it attaches to, again, that's right next to this first genu. Uh, the superficial petrosal nerve comes off that way and then that first genu happens and it becomes a tympanic segment, which kind of 
kind of sneaks up along horizontally past the ossicles, makes that second genu again by the pyramidal eminence, which is where this little cepedial tendon is coming off, makes that turn, um, goes vertically, the mastoid segment kind of gives off the chord of tympani, and then finally comes out of the stylomastoid foramen and becomes the branches that we all know and love um, to Zanzibar by motor car or whichever, whichever one. Perhaps a tiny zebra bit my cheek was kind of the other acronym. We had whatever it takes to remember the branches of the facial nerve once they get out of the temporal bone. That's not my area. Just kidding. I love all facial nerves. Um, so gonna hit those surgical relationships better since I got this nice picture. That's the one you recall, but let's take off the ossicles. So now the malleus and incus are gone. You have the stapes here, that's the pedial tendon. And now you can better see uh, the cochleiform process, which is where that tensor tympani muscle is attaching. And you can see um, the cog here, and you can like understand this relationship to the facial nerve. Knowing where the facial nerve is important, you need like every little tiny landmark. It's like if you're going to scrub into a parotid and you look up beforehand, oh, what are the five ways to find like five ways to find a facial nerve because you know someone's going to pimp you on it. These are kind of the ear ones that you have to know. You can know its relationship. It's superior to the cochleiform process. Um, the supertubal recess is marked by the cog here, and so, so the facial nerve is kind of sneaking through here. It passes inferior um, or a little anteromedial to the lateral semicircular canal. And again, the second genu is by the pyramidal eminence, and it goes down. Sometimes it can be dehiscent in here, so if you're doing a nice middle ear surgery and you see this like nice bright white facial nerve you gotta be careful with that don't don't get too close to it or if you're trying to do a stapes and you look in there's a facial nerve herniating over your stapedial foot plate you kind of got to change your plans a little uh, never forget again that the carotid is right there if you all right so long as my train of thought so i'm just remembering what my next picture was so here we have a good view I kind of like threw all these pieces of the anatomy at you, all these things that are in here, and like how to find them based on where everything is. And sometimes you have to get into this space and to this anatomy from a different angle so that you can reach things. So if this is looking straight through an ear canal, a lot of the times our approach to this space is through the mastoid. Um, so that's why the 3D part of it's important. You got to kind of be able to shift how you're thinking. So if you're looking straight here, if you think, well, this is anterior up here, this is posterior back here, the mastoid's posterior. So mastoidectomy just takes you this anatomy a little bit from the back. So if you've got, if we were initially looking, here's a picture of a, a mastoidectomy, by the way. If we were initially looking through this ear canal, now it's just kind of everything's tilted a little bit backwards. So you still have um, your incus, your mouth, yeah. your malleus, your incus, your incutocepedial joint, your stapes. Um, you still have your lateral semicircular canal, which we can see in the other picture, and the facial nerve still has those same relationships to these things. So you still have your second genu right here by your pyramidal eminence, and you're hooking up to your stapes. You can see it's still passing um, anteromedial to your lateral semicircular canal. If you took out the incus and the malleus, you'd be able to see the cog, which is where it's making its other turn up um, and up more into the tegmen. So again, that's why it's you can have like a photo in your mind of what the endoscopic anatomy looks like, but you're always coming at these structures from different directions. So that's why you kind of got to have your, your landmarks and your roadmap. Now, if I took all of this stuff out, there's, there's brain and stuff in there. So deep to all this, you take out um, your semicircular canals. Um, this is more of the labyrinthectomy approach to get to your internal acoustic, um, wow, what am I saying? Internal acoustic canal, you have to, kind of take these out and get down to it. So that's like deeper and deeper in. Always remembering again where your jugular bulb is, big bloody friends. And then I kind of talked about looking down the ear canal, looking posteriorly. I'm gonna wrap up in just a second, but the other way to kind of think about getting to this space is from above. So if you do a middle cranial fossa approach, if you're doing hearing preservation surgery for a vestibular noma, for example, it's just looking at it superior. So rather than, again, posterior is kind of back this way, where if you'd be looking in from a mastoid, you'd be here. If you're looking in the ear canal, you'd be here. This is just looking at it from above. Same thing. Here's your um, words, your cochleiform process, your tensor tympani muscle, and here's that same um, darn facial nerve, that same first genu hanging out right next to it. 
you still got your lateral semicircular canal with your second genu of the facial nerve coming down here. Um, I kind of want you like know all that stuff. Not saying it's easy, but <laughs> you just kind of got to think of it from all these different directions. So that's my spiel about ear stuff, which I would disguise as a temporal bone anatomy talk. Um, so it's really important um, for all this to get a good 3D understanding of the anatomy, which is true for any surgical approach or anything. It's easier to know where the structures are in relation to each other. Because even sometimes if I'm looking at, um, I just did like a bunch of left ear surgery in a row and all of a sudden I'm looking at a right ear and I'm using the word superior when I mean inferior, like you sometimes can't like, trust your visual brain. <laughs> sometimes you have to like just make sure you check where everything is so that you know where you are and always know where the facial nerve is. Always, always. Very important, don't take out the facial nerve that's bad form. Questions? And yeah, do you have advice for them for how you learn this anatomy? Because it's very confusing when you first look at it. Any tricks to pick it up? Definitely is confusing. Um, I would say one thing is part of what really helps is to go into the temporal bone lab and drill some of it yourself. Or if you can find like a 3D model of a temporal bone, just to really look at that. Because the 3D part of it is what's strange. The textbooks are really helpful, especially the Atlas, the Jack the Atlases I was talking about. And it's just kind of looking at it again and again and um, letting yourself, like telling yourself that it's okay to not get it every time. I feel like every time I restudy the anatomy, I learn something a little new or something like clicks just a little bit better. Uh, and if you keep just like plugging away at it, you'll get it. Um, my 3D, like, my sense of how things work in three-dimensional space is not the best, and even I got it, so I believe in you. Anyone have questions for her? I, I, I watched the drilling of the mastoid, and, and I was just curious of, like, when you see, like, when you're drilling through the bone, do you visually see the semicircular canal? It, it just looks so much like bone to me, and even when it was pointed out to me, it just still looks a lot like bone. Like, how, how, do you, how do you notice it when you're, like, drilling? Yes. So with more and more practice, it's interesting. You really start to notice the quality of the bone. So these words that people are telling you, you really start to internalize it, especially once you start to work in the lab and you drill it. Um, like, the mastoid air cell bones are just, like, thin, wispy. You, like, get through it really easily. But when you see the bone of the labyrinth, it is one of the hardest bones in the body, and it just is like thicker, wider, like you can't see it at all. And you also kind of know where it's supposed to be. Um, so it's, all, it's more of a matter of like, one, experience. You've seen it a million times. You know what it's supposed to look like. And you can, and two, like you can appreciate that that bone really does look, look pretty different once you're like used to what it's supposed to look like. Cool. Yeah. If you ever have the chance to drill in the lab, I think that's the best way of learning this anatomy. You can look at the CTs and the 3D pictures and everything, but until you actually cut it all apart, it, I think it's really hard to, to conceptualize where everything is and how close things are and what they look like so that you don't hit them by accident. Because it's all great to see it in the uh, pictures, but then when you get to a patient, you get in trouble because things aren't exactly where you think they're gonna be. They're just a little bit different. So I think when you get awesome. someone with, with like really bad ear disease and your landmarks feel like they're gone, there yeah. will always be some landmarks there. You just have to find them. 